Do solemnly swear. New chair, new direction. I have to board the motion fails. Lessons of politics and education playing out in real time. I was shocked and surprised. The superintendent's future in flux. New majority in the House. What's at stake for South Florida? Continuously watch other immigrants and other migrants who are given the opportunity that Haitian migrants are consistently denied. South Florida's Haitian American Congresswoman paying attention to a crisis in Haiti. We are on the precipice if something doesn't change. Food insecurity rising along with grocery prices. I haven't seen this kind of desperation since the height of the pandemic. Really concerned. We think there could be a crisis looming. The news and the newsmakers this week in South Florida. Good morning. Glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putnam. I'm Glenna Milberg. We begin with real time learning about the politics of education. This week brought big change to the direction of South Florida schools and for Broward County in particular. Newly elected board members in Broward County were sworn in to replace four interim members who had been appointed by the governor and the new board members quickly reversed some of what their predecessors had done. One of their key acts was voting in as their chair their board as the board chair, Lori Aladuff, and Debbie Hickson as vice chair. That gives the families who lost loved ones in the Stoneman Douglas High shootings the upper hand in formulating school policy in Broward. And Lori Aladuff, Ms. Chair, is with us this morning. Lori, it's great to see you. Lori, welcome. Good morning. We are so glad to see you. When you were sworn in, you made some really interesting, upbeat, optimistic comments about setting a new path for the school board. Describe what that new path is. Absolutely. So we need to get our focus back on our students and our schools, and we need to focus on our strategic plan and implementing that plan so that we can provide the best education and the safest education for all of our students. You know, Lori, there are some changes you all made right off the bat, right after being sworn in. We'll get to those in just a moment. but. It, it really bears focusing on four years after you as chair, Deborah Hickson as vice chair, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas families who with profound loss in their lives and, and a legacy being left as you run for the school board, take over chair, vice chair. I, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas families are running Broward schools now and I, I really would love to hear and have our viewers hear your perspective on that. So it's gonna be almost five years this February, and I'm honored to be chair of the Broward County School Board. You know, my focus and the reason why I got on the school board was because of the death of my daughter, Alyssa, who was murdered at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. But the fact that I can help lead our district as chair of the board, it's so important to me to make sure that school safety is a top priority and that we focus on our strategic plan. Uh, Lori, let me ask you, we all want to hear you speak about Dr. Vicki Cartwright, who was fired a couple of weeks ago uh, on a five to four vote with all five of the governor's appointees voting to terminate her contract. She still works for the school district because her contract stipulated she needed a 60 day notice. What is the future as far as you are concerned of Dr. Cartwright? So yeah, so Dr. Cartwright was fired. She is currently the superintendent. She has that 60 days in her contract. The previous board made that decision and made that vote. You know, as you know, there's new board members that are on the school board right now. We haven't yet been able to have a conversation as far as anything, you know, changing, hypothetically rescinding that vote. But we did vote that day to move forward for a national search to find a transformative super superintendent, which I did uh, agree to do. And I think it's very important that we stay focused in the attention on our students and that we can't be flip-flopping as a board. We have to be laser focused on making sure that we're providing an excellent education for our students. 
And to your point, one of the things I think a lot of people in Broward and in all of South Florida watching the new politics and education, you, you are steering a ship that really has not had a rudder in so long. Um, and, and not the least of which was a scathing, that scathing grand jury report. Um, want to go into some of the votes you made this week. One of the first orders of business was undoing what the prior board had done for charter schools and allocating, I think it was about 10 million, maybe a little less than $10 million of property taxes to charter schools specifically, 90 of them in the county. Why did you rescind that? Why not share property tax with charter schools, which are technically public schools? Sure, but our charter schools, they don't have to play by the same rules as our traditional public schools have to play by. And so I was in favor of rescinding that vote. I think it's extremely important that we provide as much money back into our traditional public schools. Charter schools do receive PICO funding. And like I said, they don't play by the same rules that we have to play by. And that money, there's millions of dollars, 10 million this year, 20 million, the previous, the following year, could go back into our traditional public schools, like providing playgrounds for our schools that don't currently have a playground. Yeah. Uh, you know, let me go back to the Vicki Cartwright situation. Uh, you said that you had voted in favor of a national search to find a transformative leader. Um, is, is Dr. Cartwright out of the running? So as it stands right now, Dr. Cartwright has been fired from the school board. What can come forward um, in the next, you know, cup following weeks, I don't know. And it, I think it is very important that we do hear from the new school board members that they have a voice in this process. That's why I wasn't pre prepared at the time yeah. to move forward with the motion to hire Dr. Smiley because I wanted the new board members to have a voice in who would even be the interim superintendent. I think that's really important and um, we'll see what happens. Yeah, let me just point out, I'm sure Glenna was going to do it, that under the Florida Sunshine Law, you cannot simply call up other board members and have private conversations. I mean, this all has to happen in public, which is going to happen at your next meeting. When is your next meeting? So uh, we are at the Florida School Board Association, some of the board members this following week. And then after that, on Tuesday, will be our next school board meeting. So let, let's talk a little bit about that public process. Was it a concern to you that the firing process happened late at night with no notice? Mm -hmm. um, certainly, you know, it's not, not for us to say what is proper or improper for the former board to have done. Um, but in your perspective, was the process fair to Dr. Cartwright, who, who we are going to be talking to uh, in just a little while live as well? I might as well just throw that out there. Was that process in public enough? Was it fair? So I was the board member that brought up asking the question to our general counsel whether this went against the Sunshine Law. And we were told at the time that it didn't. You know, I think that it went against the spirit of the law and the process that we normally do. I brought a B1 item forward uh, previously against Mr. Runcie to fire him. So I know what that process is. That process is very important because it does allow for the public to come in to comment. It allows for the media to be present. And it also allows for every school board member to be prepared with their comments and to speak on it. Yeah. Uh, Laura, you were reelected easily in August in the primary, 61% of the vote, I believe, which is a vote of confidence in you and in your ability to lead the board. The, the, the grand jury uh, report expressed mis, you know, uh, it said that the board had mismanaged the $800 million bond issue for renovation, construction of schools uh, in Broward County. Is that under control now? So I believe it is under control. We are moving forward. We have a goal to be complete with the smart bond program by 2025. And so I am very excited to have that you know, complete, but it really needs to be done with transparency, fidelity. We need to make sure that there are no issues that we're trying to 
you know, save or be on target with our costs as much as possible and prevent delays. But it's still very important that we as school board members, that we hold the superintendent accountable for making sure that the smart bond is complete by 2025. That accountability and responsibility and scrutiny on school districts around the state like never before. And we yeah. will absolutely keep in touch. So mm -hmm. appreciate your time, Lori. Lori Allen, Thank thanks. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Up next, as promised, the school superintendent herself. Dr. Vicki Cartwright will join us with a view on her future, which is kind of elusive and foggy. Broward's embattled school superintendent came to the job to a district in chaos. That scathing grand jury report, a predecessor charged with perjury. Eventually, almost half of her bosses on the school board suspended and then temporarily replaced by the governor. That group of DeSantis appointees uh, fired Vicki Cartwright last week, but a majority of them were replaced by an election, and the newly elected board members were sworn in, and then they tried to reinstate Dr. Cartwright. They did not do that. Meanwhile, Vicki Cartwright is on the job either way under the terms of her contract, as we discussed. That's until late January. Vicki Cartwright right there live via Zoom. Thanks so much, Ms. Superintendent, for being with us. Dr. Cartwright, welcome. We're glad to see you. Glad to have a chance to hear from you. Uh, you just heard, I suspect, Lori Aladef say she is intent on a national search for a permanent uh, superintendent. Uh, that seems to, you know, not speak well of your chances. Do you still think you could be reinstated by the board? I believe uh, that the new board can whatever that they believe is right. Uh, so in the event that they want to bring back my contract for a conversation, that is something that they can do, yes. So you were terminated without cause, that's a legal term. Um, however, there were your former school board bosses out as of this week, uh, listed 15 items, I actually pulled them, because um, I really want to talk about some of them that you're supposed to improve upon and, and maybe what you've done or maybe what you don't think needs improvement. I just want to throw out there as we begin this conversation that your detractors and your supporters alike this week have really commented on the grace and professionalism that you are exhibiting in this time of turmoil. So, so good, good for you on that. Um, so <laughs> the 15 things Dr. Cartwright are broken down into teaching and learning, uh, judgment and political acumen, um, accusing you of playing politics, accusing you of not doing enough to address a decline in the school district population for public schools, uh, leadership and decision making, um, and some of the things identified in the grand jury report, which you were not even part of, not even with the district then. So, so I know you know all 15. They're on our website if anybody wants to see them. But I'd like for you to address your perspective, what you've been doing, what you think you should be doing better, and where this is going. Certainly. So there is a lot of um, items that are listed there, and some of them are factually based, some of them not as much, uh, and, but it's more based uh, related to perception. But of course, uh, perception means it is somebody's reality. And so that is something that I take very seriously. And so when we're looking at the items that are there, I've been literally on the job uh, for about nine months now. And so that's I think that's something that a lot of people were confused about because they were thinking that it's something that's been happening under me for an extended period of time. And as I mentioned before, I was hired permanently, uh, made official at the end of February. And so from that, uh, many of the items that are listed there are things that I have been addressing um, as far as make, being very decisive, making um, some changes in order to benefit the students within Broward County Public Schools is very important to me. Uh, we had a, a huge uh, structure change over the summer where we uh, went in. We reorganized uh, the district. We put us back into regional offices, um, as well as an associate superintendent for non-traditional schools. Uh, and we're really working on the culture and climate of the district right now. And that culture and climate, meaning that we have to have that sense of urgency um, in everything that we do. And not only that, but we have to have that customer 
customer um, service mentality with it. In other words, what can we do in order to most benefit our schools, our staff within our schools, and our students? In those schools, uh, because before it was always like a, a mentality of the schools were here to serve the district. Well, in reality, we're here as a district to support our schools, uh, because that is real where the real work occurs every single day is with our students. Can, can I just and ask so, a quick, a quick mm-hmm. follow up on that? When you say customer service, are the customers the students? Are the customers the parents? Because mm-hmm. there's a, a huge turn yeah. toward parents' rights, who or both. Mm-hmm. Who are the customers? It's actually both. It's going to be both. It depends upon what the what the issue is that you're working on, right? So it could the customer could be our students. Ultimately, that's what we're about is putting students first and making sure that they have access to high quality instruction on a daily basis, and that we're taking care of the whole child. Um, so ultimately, that's our that is our focus. And in order to do that, that means not only are we serving our students, but we have to make sure um, that we're we're responsive to the needs of our families as well. And so that's going to be our parents, guardians and caregivers, Um, our teachers in the classrooms, those who are working one on one with our our students. Um, It could be our our ESPs, our paraprofessionals. Um, It could be our school administrators. Um, So our principals and our assistant principals, those those leaders that are making a difference every single day. Uh, It could be the community for which the school serves and for which the district serves as well. So it dependent upon the situation is going to define who those customers are. Yeah. Dr. Cartwright, the, the school board, as previously made up with the five appointees by the governor, uh, in October, they laid out this program for improvements, areas where they wanted you to do better, and then they gave you 90 days to sort of make a start on it. I mean, clearly, you've been working on it. And then suddenly, at the next meeting, out of the blue, 10 o'clock at night, comes the motion on his last day by a board member you know, to terminate you uh, without notice. Did that violate the uh, sunshine law in the state of Florida? You know, I agree with Chairman Aladeff. I do believe that it violated the spirit of the sunshine law. Um, and that that's, that's very important uh, because, frankly speaking, I believe in my heart of heart, had people known that this was what's going to be on the agenda. No, they would have been there. They would have been, been there. Yeah. They would have asked to speak. Yeah. And the media, I mean, as a matter of fact, our reporter tried to get into the meeting and was not allowed into the meeting. So it was a a terrible, not a good situation. Yes, I know. Unfortunately, there was a mistake that was made um, right there at the very end. Um, I will say the vote did occur uh, prior to media even trying to get into the to the school board office. Yeah. You know, um, that that vote, Kevin Tynan, one of the outgoing members, was on this program and, and talked about his decision. We're coming up against a break, so I want to take a quick break, but I want to talk about what he said tripped his decision and get your thoughts on that when we come right back. See what this. We are back with Broward School Superintendent Vicki Cartwright. Um, Dr. Cartwright, we, last segment we were talking about the vote, uh, late night vote with very little public attention on your termination. Uh, 60 days from now that ends and we don't know what's going to happen in the interim. But, um, but for now, Kevin Tynan, who was one of the outgoing board members who eventually did vote for your termination, uh, talked about what a difficult decision that was and that it ultimately for him came down to this audit on a particular vendor that had a very questionable to them um, relationship with the school district. And, and it, if you read the grand jury report, that, that is kind of a theme, oversight, uh, vendors, contracts. And I wonder if you could go into how you are handling what has been an intractable problem for Broward's district and perhaps others. Absolutely. So that is one of the areas that um, I'm one of the areas that I know I need to look into or actually have been looking into and will continue to as well is really looking at the process related to uh, the whole 
procurement process itself. Um, and that is not just within the procurement department, I'll make that clear, uh, because we all have ownership into that. Um, so if it's a teaching and learning product, um, something that deals with instruction. So who is involved with it? Um, what does that look like? What type of oversight is occurring? And what do we need to do? Um, so when I first started here, uh, that was something originally uh, the chief auditor had reported directly to me. And so I had met with him and spoken with him on a few areas that we wanted to take a look into. Uh, and the reason is, is because when you do an audit, that is when you, you're able to find what's working and what's not working as well as it should be. And so it's something, it gives you a tool um, and it gives you that roadmap on how to address those things um, so that you can put in corrective action where needed and you can continue to support those things where they are working well. Uh, so, frankly speaking, for an audit to be used against me, um, especially the ones for like, for example, uh, the cap and gown audit that was done, that was even before my time, it, I wonder what message that really is sending. Uh, because what I'm trying to do is I'm using the findings in order to make corrective action where needed. And then, like I said, support where it's already working well. And are you are you so finding that really helps? Let me just um, forgive the interruption. Are you are you finding because reading the grand jury report, speaking to the people who want to see stuff change quickly, are you finding pushback from a, a staff or a bureaucracy or people who are used to just letting things go? Do you find that as superintendent? There are elements of that that are here in Broward County Schools. And so those are the things that I have been addressing. Again, uh, you've heard me mention earlier where I reorganized the district. And a lot of that was to make sure that we put in the proper oversights um, and we put in the right accountability and put in systems and processes uh, so that we are able to support the wonderful things that are happening here. And we're also able to hold people accountable when things aren't working as well as they should be. Yeah, it sounds to me like in a way there is a deep state <laughs> within the Broward County School District. Within, it's an institution. Uh, Dr. Carr, let me ask you, uh, you've been in education all your adult life, so you're so uh, well aware of this, particularly the events of the last uh, couple of months. But the one area, I mean, Glenna and I have covered politics here for a long time, the one area where elected bodies are not terribly partisan, where they sort of put politics aside have been school boards, but that has certainly changed. It's changed in the South Florida and the Miami-Dade Broward school boards. Uh, is this going to further divide school boards and the way they do their work? Um, I think the most important thing is just keep the politics out of it. Uh, you know, and I appreciate you recognizing earlier where uh, I've been very, very professional um, throughout this entire time, which I'm going to do. It is what is needed for our children and it is what's needed for our district. I'm not going to get overly emotional one way or the other uh, because the whole reason I'm in education is because I'm here to serve others. I am here to serve the students of Broward County Public Schools and the staff that are here and our community as a whole. All right, and one last question we, before, mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, one last question because we're running out of time and I, I really heard something that I think I, um, bears addressing. Uh, Tori Alston, who was the chair, still on the board, no longer the chair last, uh, last month, I believe he was with us, cited some statistics that you, the superintendent, um, I think really need to address for parents, for stakeholders. He was talking about third grade proficiency in English at 52% and eighth grade proficiency in science at 37%. He mentioned algebra, but adults even aren't proficient in algebra, so I'll leave that one out. But those, you know, kidding aside, those are some really concerning numbers post-COVID. Uh, take the next, you know, 30 seconds or a minute and tell this community how students are going to be made proficient in basic work. So I think what's really important is we do have a strategic plan right now that allows us to be very laser focused. Um, we have gone in and we're taking a look at some of the strategies for how we are supporting our schools. So we have changed that as well. Uh, and we're also ensuring that we are monitoring the progress of our students appropriately. And even on Saturdays now, um, starting this upcoming Saturday, we have uh, tutoring that is available to all third graders throughout the entire district. It's free. 
uh, and it's held at our our elementary schools. Um, so it's our Saturday, Saturday tutoring program. They get free busing um, if parents need that, and they sure online, um, and um, it's going to be smaller groups. So we're really, again, we're very, very focused uh, on these areas. So we have that available for our third graders. We have that available for our eighth graders, as well as for our 11th and 12th graders who are not on track for graduating on time. Uh, so it's thinking outside the box, doing things different than what we have done in the past, um, as well as um, even how we teach reading in Broward County, we have changed. Um, we've gone from balanced literacy to the science of teaching, uh, the, the science of reading. And so from there, we are making sure that we're putting in the right systems in place, supporting the best that we can, and um, working one-on-one -on -one with our students so that they do become proficient. Yeah, well, we, we hope you succeed because the loss of learning in 2021 across the country was just devastating, and it certainly is uh, critical for you and for every school district. Dr. Vicki Cartwright, we're so glad you were with us. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. I, thank you very much for having me. And again, I, I greatly appreciate everybody, and congratulations to all of my brand new board members, as well as to my board chair, Lori Aladeff. Thank you, Superintendent. Up next, we're gonna talk to Congresswoman Sheila Sherfalis McCormick about a lot of things and the latest crisis in Haiti. And about a developing crisis, perhaps, in the neighboring Dominican Republic, that is next. The ongoing crisis in Haiti just keeps getting worse. Violent gangs control much of the capital and the country, and the economy is reeling. And South Florida has a direct and personal connection to the desperation of Haitians getting on boats, duped by smugglers bound for Florida and possibly family. Yet the majority right now are quickly deported back to that country in crisis. This week, South Florida Congresswoman Sheila Sherfalis McCormick stepped up with a call to action. The Congresswoman uh, newly reelected joins us now live. Congresswoman, great to have you aboard this morning. Great to see Good you morning. back, Congresswoman. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me this morning. All right. So let's talk first about the, the migrants who are continue to come from Haiti. We saw the boat, the, the sailing ship that had about 200 people that arrived down in the Keys this week, and it was almost disastrous. The Coast Guard, uh, Customs and Border Patrol, local authorities, thank the Lord, saved most of those people. Uh, there was one fatality perhaps out of about 200 people, but now all of those people, it appears, have been repatriated, sent back to Haiti. Are you good with that? Not at all. What we're seeing right now is that we've been taking the affirmative steps to try and stabilize Haiti. The gangs have risen to a place where they took over a lot of the country. And so I'm happy that the international community, as well as Congress, is finally stepping up and trying to make sure we can end the blockade of fuel, which we recently did, and also the sanctions that we're imposing against people who are funding the gangs and the, gangs, the gang members themselves. And recently we saw um, sanctions on Haitian people who've been funding the gang, who after they live in the United States. That was a huge step and Canada led that action. Um, and it's a step in the right direction. We have to cut off the pipeline of finances, ammunition, guns into Haiti. And then we can start really seeing the migration issue end. So right now we're dealing with a really tough problem with sending immigrants, migrants back to Haiti in the middle of a disaster. But we're working as hard as we can to make sure we can have policies in place that actually help. So if you notice that TPS has been extended for Haitian people, which is a win, but we need a lot more to really deal with this issue. Yeah, you know, migration from Haiti is actually right now part of a larger crisis, migration from all sorts of places, Cuba, Central America, up through Mexico, as you know. And so many of the South Florida congressmen and women have been working on trying to make reforms to immigration in a bipartisan way, uh, probably to no avail that works in a holistic way. You've heard your colleagues in South Florida, your Republican colleagues say, Migration can't be fixed until the border is secure. There is a real perception that the border is open. We were there last year when 15,000 Haitians were at that border lawfully looking for asylum. Many of them, adult men, summarily deported. Do you see a discrepancy in treatment between different groups of, Haitian, of uh, migrants? 
There definitely is a discrepancy, and we've been working to address that. And I think a lot of the Republican talking points of ending the border, closing the border, the border is actually closed. When we have people who are looking for political asylum, that is actually a real process, a legitimate process to seek asylum within the United States. But what we have to focus on is really the hard work. The hard work is to try and stabilize these countries so we won't have immigrants, come migrants coming to our borders. And that's what we've been focusing on. Recently, I was appointed to the Foreign Affairs Committee, which is a huge feat for our district because after we lost Congressman Ted Deutsch from there, we didn't really have a voice. So I'm happy to be on that committee. And so far, the committee has been partisan. That's one of the few places that we actually find partisan politics is in foreign affairs. Um, and that's great for us in South Florida because we're seeing a lot of these policies that impact us directly. So I'm happy we can focus on ending migration by helping the neighboring countries and being good neighbors so we can help them become stabilized. Yeah. Congresswoman, <clears throat> excuse me, as you well know, uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic share the island of Hispaniola. And this week in Santo Domingo in the DR, the United States Embassy issued a warning to black uh, American visitors, tourists, uh, that maybe they should not go to Haiti because the Dominican Republic uh, police were picking up anybody who they thought was a Haitian. So uh, it, it's a dire situation. The DR says, no, this is not so. We're not mistreating people. What is your understanding of what's going on there? Well, exactly what you mentioned. We've noticed and we've gotten reports, several reports, that any African-American or anyone from African descent who has black skin, basically, has been targeted in the Dominican Republic, such as being stopped by immigration forces, being harassed. And so we've spoken excessively to the Dominican Republic, and they're denying it. But every single day, we are actually getting videos of people being pulled off of mopeds, people being stopped in the street. And the one commonality they have is they have black skin. And if we look at the history of the Dominican Republic. They have a history of implementing policies that result in ethnic, ethnic cleansing. And I find ourselves here again. In the 1930s, we saw the, the Parsley Massacre. As a Haitian American woman who has parents and family who actually came from the Dominican Republic during the Parsley Massacre, it, it, it's so reminiscent of that time period. And right now, when we see that Dominican Republic has a myriad of immigrants from Asian to um, Latin American to just everyone, even European, but to be targeting every black person in the country to the fact to the place where black people from all across the world can no longer feel comfortable residing or even being a tourist in the Dominican Republic, that's when the international community and Congress has to step up. And I'm proud that we did step up and make sure that we do not allow modern day ethnic cleansing to go on, especially when it's being so blatant. Congresswoman, these school people who are not really watching or have a day-to-day -day, uh, working knowledge of what is happening, the, the gangs that are controlling now, last I saw a figure, 60 percent of Port-au-Prince and the ports in Haiti and making life so unbearable, who is funding them here? Who is sending them weapons? Weapons are not manufactured in Haiti. And what, what do they want? What is, besides power, obviously, what is the end game that, that all of this is happening with such consequence to South Florida? Well, at the end of the regime, or when um, Maurice was actually killed and assassinated, there was a power vacuum that developed in Haiti. And the gangs were being normalized even while he was there. But once he was assassinated, they just expanded. And they started taking over different parts of Haiti. But the most important thing that we have to notice, as the gangs were taking part in taking over Haiti, they were creating so many travesties when it comes to human rights, with raping women, taking over neighborhoods, killing people. And the government really wasn't doing anything. Right now, we have a de facto uh, president in Haiti, and we've been working with Dr. Ariel Henry trying to get some relief, but it really wasn't working. And that's when the United States started asking Haiti, what is it that you need? And the international community. We've been able to provide them, along with Canada, um, different truckers and mi military-grade weapons so they, the police, the Haitian police, can fight the gangs. And that has been working. If you've noticed in the past months, we had issues even in Haiti where we had the human rights crisis 
where it was the gangs, but also we had a blockade when it came to gas and fuel. We were able to assist the Haitian military and the Haitian police to end the blockade from the gangs, and now fuel is able to travel throughout the country. However, we're still finding an issue with cholera and having their proper pathways to bring medicine and medical help into the country. And that's why making sure that we can stabilize Haiti from the gangs becomes so imperative. Right now, as we're looking at a humanitarian crisis that encapsulates hunger, food, medicine, and even cholera, it's just so detrimental. And that's why we're seeing migration yeah. pattern. Yeah, Haiti is uh, failing its people in so many ways, and the impact is being felt here in South Florida. Congresswoman, hold on. We've got more questions for you. So stay right there. We'll be right back. Well, I want to apologize to Congresswoman McCormick and to you. We said, I said, that we were going to come back with more questions for her, but our time has expired with her, and we want to move on to food insecurity in South Florida. Most of us are still digesting our Thanksgiving Day feast, but many in South Florida didn't get one. And too many are currently struggling to buy the week's groceries. With the cost of food and most everything else up, South Florida food banks say they are struggling to meet needs. Paco Velez is president and CEO of Feeding South Florida, here to detail the numbers and that need. Paco, I think the last time we spoke was sometime last year, right about this time. It's mm -hmm. good to have you back. Hey, Paco, how are you? Doing great, how are you? We're well. All right, so how, how dire is the food insecurity problem in South Florida? Well, there are a lot of factors at play in South Florida, actually across the country. Uh, first and foremost, our families continue to get hit. First, it was a pandemic that uh, affected over 1.6 million people here in South Florida with food insecurity. As folks started getting back to work, that number started to go below a million individuals. Economic crisis hits, our families get hit again. Uh, rent goes up, fuel goes up, cost of goods goes up. And, and now we're seeing over 1.2 million individuals coming to the food bank a lot more frequently. Uh, so they're, they're seeing their costs go up, but we're seeing a, a perfect storm of, of issues from supply chain issues to, to, to swine flu, bird flu, things that are affecting um, what we eat, even Hurricane Ian that affected some of the crops here in South Florida. So it's the supply just isn't meeting the demand, which is creating a, 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 a higher cost of living and a higher cost of food. Well, you know, I feel like since the beginning of 2020, since pandemic and then inflation and then all these crises that you're talking about, um, we watch the food lines. We, we don't see your process, people, families going to pick up their food, but we do see food lines around the, the community. There are hundreds of organizations who try to feed people in need. But I guess my question to you, Paco, is th there's been years of need and we're in a community of staggering poverty and staggering wealth and people in between that. At what point do people qualify for picking up free food? How does that work? You're absolutely right. There's a huge disparity between the haves and have nots, um, especially here in South Florida. We, we are a travel destination and, and, and a very service oriented industry. So uh, wages don't really keep up with the cost of living here. Uh, so families uh, come into one of our many nonprofit, as you mentioned, we have over 300 different nonprofit organizations that we partner with. We prefer families to go into these nonprofit organizations so they can choose their food versus getting into a line and having to wait in this long light in the, in the South Florida heat or South Florida rain, and then be given a bag of food versus choosing what they're going to eat. But families that go through our, 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 our choice pantries, our mobile pharmacies, uh, or our, our partner agency network, um, they share their, their information. They say, here's where I'm from. Here's, here's, uh, here's my, my income and, and I'm not able to make ends meet. And for many families, uh, the cost of food, the cost of rent, the cost of fuel, there's a gap. And as, as our network, our, our Feeding South Florida, Feeding America network, our role, our job, our duty is to eliminate one of those decisions and ensure families don't have to choose between food and anything else. Yeah. Uh, as you well know, Paco, there is the SNAP program, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Plan for uh, people who are poor, disabled seniors. Uh, what is the crossover between people 
who are getting food stamps, as they're commonly known, and coming to Feeding South Florida and its affiliates. So SNAP, food stamps, it's really you need to be a U.S. citizen, you need to be employed, uh, and you need to be making under a certain amount of money in order to qualify for these benefits. Those are the three things that folks need to have in place. Um, however, those benefits are just not stretching as far as they used to. So we're seeing families, instead of coming us uh, to us at the last week of their benefits when they're about to run out, they're coming up to us after the first, maybe even second week right. um, of their benefits running out. So they're just not going as far as they used to. Where, Paco, does the food come from that you give out to families, whether it's in your warehouse or, or all of the, the network that you just described? Where, where's the food coming from? We have a, a diverse portfolio of, of food. Uh, we have great retailers. We have one of the, the we have the largest retail uh, pickup program in the Feeding America network across the country with over 500 dif different retail partners that we pick up from uh, here in South Florida. We, we work with uh, distribution centers, manufacturers. We work with a, a great amount of growers. South Florida, a lot of people don't know, a huge agricultural community in Palm Beach County, Miami-Dade County, and then with our Feeding America network, we're able to go across the country and pick up from corporate partners like Kellogg's and Kraft and some of these bigger companies where we're able to bring in food from across the country. So that involves trucks and gas and costs and logistics. And warehouses and exactly. all kinds of things. Yeah, so that's the thing is uh, this, this economic crisis is affecting our families, but also affecting uh, our fleet. You see behind me our, our fleet, we have diesel trucks. We also pick up from across the, the country and, and the price of gas is going up. The price of transporting product is going up. Um, the price of our lease here at this facility is going up from 780 to 1150 a uh, square foot. So we're seeing a, a over 40% increase just in, 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 our, in our facility. So there's, there's a lot at play um, and a lot of issues that, that are affecting our families and, and their access to food. Yeah, Paco, we have so many generous people who are viewers of Channel 10. We're grateful they're there. And I know many of them have written checks, have made donations to Feeding South Florida. Give us the address, the telephone number. <clears throat> if somebody wants to contribute, where do they do it? You're absolutely right. South Florida is a very, very generous community, whether it's a, a, a storm, a pandemic, or a government shutdown or economic crisis, uh, South Florida has always been very giving, very generous with their time and their funds. The best way to really uh, find out more and to get involved is go to our website, feedingsouthflorida.org. Uh, we're located, uh, we're next door neighbors, so we're located in Pembroke Park, 2501 Southwest 32nd Terrace in Pembroke Park, um, or just call us, 954-518-1818. Um, and not only are we able to, uh, to, to get you as part of a solution to, to help our community, but those that are in need of our assistance, please uh, get in touch with us as well. And, and you, Feeding South Florida, Farm Share, hundreds of others, uh, organizations, I, I just want people to know Charity Navigator is one of the organizations that rates charities. Feeding South Florida has an almost sterling reputation for using almost 100% of the donations directly yeah. for for the, the purpose, in other words, not administrative salaries and logistics. So, so that's something that I think is very important for people to know. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Paco, we appreciate the work that you and all of your folks do. Thank you so much and thanks for being with us. Thank you guys. All right, and we'll be right back. We covered a lot of ground today, so to re-watch today's interviews or to listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, all you have to do is scan that QR code right there with your phone, and it takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. And as always, we thank you so much for being here with us. And remember, on Local10.com, we are online 24-7. And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. Have a great Sunday.